Patrick Smith. Good on you, Hutto. I voted for you. The Crows are finally in the eight. Their coach joins us. Welcome again to On The Couch, following round 18, part two, and the very big news, Mike Sheehan is back in love with a great game. Welcome to you, Mike, and good to see you with a smile on your face, and great to see you uh, wearing that magnificent jacket again, uh, Bungie. Thank but you're you, in love with the game, Michael. Uh, back is the, the operative word, Jared. How long yes, was the, the tip? The tip is over, Mike, yeah. but does that love have anything to do with the fact that you might have tipped four from four on the weekend? Well, thank you for noticing, Jason. I didn't want to bring it up. <laughs> no, I was at the footy Saturday night. I, I must admit, I got so comfortable watching the footy on telly, I'd forgotten how good it was to beat a big game at the mm. ground. And that was the Hawthorne Swans game. And I loved it. Any particular player take your fancy? Uh, <laughs> we'll get to him, Jared. The little bloke, mm. the Hawthorne number 28? No, bloke called uh, Tommy Rockliffe. Oh, across the board. No. Tommy Rockliffe. Look, I might be late with this, but he's now among the elite midfielders. He mightn't look as good as some, mightn't be as smooth, but his effect is equal to Selwood and Pendlebury and all the other greats of the midfield. Yeah, you've been uh, a bit he'll, be the next, it, he'll be the next Brisbane captain too. You harassed me about four weeks ago when I suggested the same thing. Was that you who said that? <laughs> <laughs> your memory is worse than mine. What took your fancy, Jason? Uh, look, I think it's already been shown a lot, but I want to talk about the shot for goal that James Podsy hardly had. Um, there's a couple of things that are horribly wrong with this. The fact is that, look, and, and the five metre rule worries me. He's had to walk a couple of metres to the right to give himself a little bit of clearance, but let's forget the five metre rule for the moment. Two things that horribly stand out for that. The first one is, why wouldn't you kick a drop punt? Yeah. Given you're a left footer, mm -hmm. so it's the perfect side for a left footer, you've got at least a 45 degree angle, why not do that? But also, if you're going to kick it around the corner, here's where I reckon they've got it wrong. You know how they decided to start turning side on to start with? Mm. They're letting everybody know. They're letting everybody know that as soon as you move, that's where you'll be moving from, that's where you'll be coming off your line. So so they sit there like they're runners coming out of the blocks on the side yep. to take in. They, they, they don't actually do it here because he shanks that. What does he only take block. half a step though when he's uh, Eddie's doing the shepherding? Yep. He's got plenty of room. Because well, the umpire had to pull them back because they were about a metre and a half away from him when they initially no, that's not set up. True. Everyone but, said that's not true. They were no, five metres away. When they initially set up before the umpire dragged them away. Is Eddie allowed to shepherd? You allowed to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, they, he can stand Everyone's where they can stand. That. That's okay. Yeah. But the point, the, the, the point is, if you go back, even if you want to run out and kick it around the corner, go back 20 metres like mm -hmm. a normal drop punt run up you then get to choose at what point you're going to mm -hmm. come out makes it a lot more difficult for those blokes on the side to actually be there to smother it and you'll probably be able to kick it off more than half a step but initially a drop punt would have been nice will he do it next time he gets the opportunity and i know you'll drag it out with uh, brett and <coughs> yes later. i will i will <laughs> and i tell you what he wouldn't want to miss another one because that could have been critical tell you what got me ex excited was just uh, the big game on saturday night which opened up the premiership race the hawks uh, were well and truly unders for a period of time but they found another leg and uh, you have a look at this magnificent uh, race for the top four spots it's alive and well and you've also got a significant race uh, still trying to get into the eight Collingwood now outside for the first time this year Adelaide inside for the first time but just imagine Mike if the finals were played today next weekend yeah you'd have Sydney v Frio you'd have Hawthorne v Geelong Port Adelaide v Adelaide what a game wow. that would yeah. be and uh, North Melbourne v well, I reckon as a neutral observer, we'd be very happy for the ladder to finish like that, brilliant. wouldn't we? It yeah. would be yeah. outstanding. So that, that battle for the eight, teams are dropping out rather than going in, Jared. Mm. Collingwood and the Gold Coast have forfeited their chances of playing finals. I don't think the Pies are absolutely out of it uh, just yet, Mike. They're on uh, even turns with the likes of uh, Adelaide and the Bombers, but uh, clearly their form has dropped. But on the weekend, they showed some signs. I know they lost, and I know Adelaide hit the post five times, but they showed a lot of signs. They dragged themselves back in. They were better, but they came off a low base. They're previous performance was pathetic. I'm not with you on the pies. I don't think they've got an alibi. They were 8-3, Jason, yep. early in the year. They've lost one. They've won one out of the last five. Mm -hmm. Six, one of the last six. One of the, one of the last six. Yeah. One and five from the last six. Now that's not good enough, is it? If you if you've got finals pretensions, you can't have that sort of record going into the, the latter part of the season. So the no, last six that. weeks, that's not good. And no, that's why they're out. But they've also had some issues. They've had Dane Swan who hasn't had a kick basically all year. Nick Maxwell mm -hmm. has been uh, injured and retired after starting the season. Fantastic. But they haven't had their forward line at all together. 
this season with Reid well, coming Ali's missed a bit and Reid's been injured, but Cloakie's been there. Cloakie hasn't had the season that he would have liked. Yeah, but it? this is a club, I think, that made a decision to go backwards, to go forwards. And I think, despite the fact they would like to play finals footy, I think they're on track. I think their list is looking really healthy. We still haven't seen uh, Freeman and Scharenberg uh, picks three and four, I think, uh, in the draft or thereabouts. They're well suited or well placed, I think, to have a crack okay. at the flag round about okay. 16, 17, 18. Jason, take Scotty Pendlebury out. Yep. Who have been their good players? Now, they should jump at us. They it, should. We should be I able to Dave say... I think Dave Beams has had a good year. He's had a, a good year, but he's a, he's a star player. I don't yep. think he's been played to the level that he could. Side bottom had the interruption with the suspension, mm. but he hasn't had the impact that we expected. Cloak hasn't done it. I'm not with you on that. I don't know why you've got the rose-coloured glasses on about Collingwood. Well, I just look forward. I'm not, I'm not uh, too worried about this year. I think Gary Pert and perhaps Bucks, who's a half, half glass, uh, sorry, a glass half full man, was looking through uh, rose-coloured glasses. But uh, for mine, I think they're exactly where they should be, and that is fighting for a spot in the eight with a view to winning flags in 16, 17 and 18. There's 16 yeah, players Well, well you've seen something I haven't seen. Well, I've seen a lot of young players, and I've mm. seen a lot of young talent coming through that list. There's 16 players missing from their uh, last premiership side, Mike, and I think that uh, we still believe that Bucks has got the full use of uh, a lot of these players. There is the 2010 premiership lineup, and uh, those in the dark are the ones that are missing. Big names, lots of them, and a number of them shunted out at the end of the year. It's a big reminder of the turnover in league football, isn't it? it that's is, only in a four-year period. But, uh, and I guess that's further to Jared's point. If you can regenerate that list after winning a premiership just four years ago and put yourself in a position where you think, Jared, in a couple of years' time they're good to go again, that's pretty clever. Do you share that view? <clears throat> I'm, I'm perhaps not quite as bullish as Jarrett. I don't think there's uh, massive issues at Collingwood. I, th I think they're going to be thereabouts. Would they be in my first couple of selections to, to win a flag in the next couple of years? Perhaps not. Let's take a look at their side in 2016. Bear in mind that the majority of players are playing their best footy between 25 and 30 years of age. You've got Marley Williams still there at 23. They may have to pick a recruit up like a Frawley. They'll probably need somebody also up forward. But if they snag a Frawley, they've got Frawley at 28, Frost at 25. We still haven't seen Scharenberg. Trust me, he is a gun. Uh, Darcy Moore is going to go uh, probably in the first round with a father and son. He's regarded as a top five pick. Two of you will be still playing. Broomhead's a gun in another 50 years. Pendlebury's still 29, Mike. Elliott's still a baby at 24. Cloak's hanging on, but still should be a star player. So is Goldsack, Beams. These, all of these guys are in the prime of their careers in two or three years' time. <laughs> You're placing a lot of faith in the development of those you early are. draft picks, yeah. aren't you? I am. But when you take first round picks, I think you're entled to expect them to well, turn tell in that serious players. There are some uh, exceptions to the rule, <laughs> and they are the exceptions. I want to ask, there's a name up there, Jason, I want to ask you about. Yep. Uh, Grundy. Now, we saw him last year, mm. and every club in the competition was saying how well Collingwood had picked and how disappointed they were they didn't take him if they had the option. And he's not playing in the seniors. He's been dropped a couple of times yeah. this year already, hasn't he? Look, he burst onto the scene, and we loved his aggression. We loved how good he was at chasing the ball at ground level, getting involved again, doing all sorts of things. I think his numbers are down this year. He has been dropped a couple of times. I think one other thing that perhaps has worked against him, we're seeing some great work from yeah, him, yeah. I think his discipline. Uh, has been a question because he is terrible if you look at the ratio of free kicks for and free kicks against. And I reckon we saw some footage a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, uh, of a side bottom. Actually, mm -hmm. he was about to remonstrate with the player. He just pushed him away and said, mate, get back. But you're position. drawing a long bow there, aren't you? Well, because he was pushed into the fence and he got up and he was going to remonstrate. Mm. And, but, but, but that the player, can't be the basis he's not in this term. No, but a teammate came in and remonstrated with him, not with the bloke that pushed yeah, him. What does that, that tell you? What does that tell you? What it tells me. Maybe his focus isn't where it needs Well, to. I want to ask both of you the question of this kid was so impressive at 19 or whatever he was last year. Mm. How could he not be a permanent fixture well, in this you team? How do you explain it then? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe there's some foundation for what you say. Maybe he's got ahead of himself, but it just staggers What's in, me. Mike? He's in his second year. Hmm. When it happens. People I mean, go up and yeah. down. Yeah. You judge so this you kid in three or four. Be, you don't think he's good enough to be the number one ruckman at Collingwood? I had him in the uh, side. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's 2016. That's right. I think I'm he, talking now. Well, Jerry. he's only a second year player, Mike. Exactly he right, goes Jerry. up and down. I mean, Ruckman, we say, take five, six, yeah. or seven years. This kid showed his potential. He's now got to mature into an AFL footballer and put in on the track to get out at the okay. MCG. Well, the best Ruckman, the best Ruck work I've seen in the absence of Grundy came from the skipper on, on uh, <laughs> against Adelaide last time. And this was this was Ruck work at its best, and it comes from Scotty Pendlebury. It seems like he's got to do the whole lot there. Now, that's, that's good, isn't it? Pendlebury to that? Beams, goal. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. And even uh, even better when you think that Dangerfield was the one responsible for Beams mm. in that stoppage. So they caught him napping and they did very, very well. Look, it was a tough day for Collingwood. Uh, and, you know, we're identifying some issues. I think the media's been pretty harsh on them. I saw a real positive for them on the weekend. If you look at the first quarter, Marley Williams mm. got touched up by Eddie Betts. And we thought the Eddie Betts show was going to be on. He kicks two goals, one in the first quarter, Eddie Betts. Should have had another free kick pay at the top of the goal square against Marley Williams for a free kick. He was that nervous. This is an error that he, uh, you know, and you just thought, oh, he's in real trouble, this young fella, and they might need to make a change. So two goals won, should have been three, because it was an easy set shot he missed. Could have been four if they paid the free kick. But then over the next three quarters, there's the free kick I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You just can't tackle a bloke around the legs while he's trying to lead. That's 10 metres out directly in front. He then fights back over the next three quarters. He keeps bets to six possessions and just the one behind. I reckon hats off to Nathan Buckley for keeping the mm. faith and I think that's a real positive. He's starting to do some great jobs. On He's one of the best small forwards in Eddie, the game yep, that he beats. Yep. Mike, tell us about the Hawks and uh, the Swans, in particular the Hawks uh, initially because... At halftime, they looked as if they were getting totally exposed by the tools marking the ball. At the end of the match, they were equal flag favourites. Yeah, early third quarter, you were in big trouble, weren't you? Yeah, Four goals down. down in a low-scoring game, and the Swans had the momentum. And had Buddy kicked straight, they were probably going to be six or seven up, weren't they? They were, so they were down 23 points. There you go, and from that uh, seven-minute mark of the third quarter, look at the turnaround for the Hawks. But we saw a couple of different changes of momentum throughout the course of the game, didn't we? Yeah, and we, we, and did. we tend to expect that when the good sides play each other now. The thing sitting there watching it. I didn't think that they could win, but I loved I thought there was a massive turn. It started with suckling in the back pocket. We watch it here, he comes out. You know, there's, there's he punches that into Birchall, yep. star Birchall. Birchall takes off, doesn't worry about going sideways or safely, kicks it to a one-on-one, -on -one, backs Bruce, mm. Bruce marks it and kicks the goal. And that brings him to within uh, two points, and I thought that's where the game swung. It was a big play, wasn't it? Oh, massive. And it's very rare that you get to exploit the Swans down the corridor yeah. like that. But, so, but you do it if you've got one on one. You're a chance yeah. if there's a one on one situation. So Birchall is starring, and Melcheski. He has been contained. Yep. I mean, the Sydney Swans, to me now, uh, and Hawthorne, it's about the battle of the midfields. Both have got magnificently potent forward lines. Both have got a few problems in defence. But uh, if you can lock down on either a Birchall or a Melcheski, you're halfway home. Well, well, the Hawks locked down on Melcheski, didn't they? Yeah, Jonathan Simpkin yep. did a very yep. good job, and I think they kept him to uh, underneath 20 possessions, and, and he didn't have the impact that he normally has. We're talking about initiative. You, there was one you liked, we all liked, Jordan Lewis well, you, took the initiative. Tell you why I like this is because we talk about dribble kicks and screw kicks and all sorts of things. This is an old-fashioned barrel, the big torpedo to open space. But it was the fact that he summed up the situation and said, "I don't have an option to kick to. What I will do is kick to space, and I'll back the little bloke who I yeah. know has got good leg speed to be able to hit a torpedo on the run." And hit it clean yeah. like that. It could have been horrible if it came off the side but of the it boot. Went to Poppy. But I'm that's summing up the home, moment. Home You've got to and love hose. the pop, don't you? <laughs> what a match winner. Uh, he'll, he'll never get paid the uh, big dollars. But this have a look at this. Have a look start. at the defence. We know he, he saw him kick that goal. Have a look at the defensive side of his game, which is what his game's built on, isn't it? We've spoken about him before, Mike. I love the bloke because I've never seen someone chase with more mm. intent. So he'll have a go here. Didn't get him. Well, you know what? I'll set <laughs> sail after this bloke. And it affects the kick. Yeah, and he's not done with yet. No, he'll get involved again. He's always there. He's he's everything that you want in yep. a player. We all love him. He gets the most that he possibly can yeah. out of the tools that he's blessed yeah. with. His pressure is absolutely superb, as you saw. But uh, Isaac Smith, again, was on fire with his domination. There are the uh, pressure acts for the uh, the most forward half pressure action. Popolo, again, on top. Uh, we're going to name that award after him. <laughs> you mentioned Isaac Smith. What he's done, Jason, he's taken the, the range where teams are prepared to concede you a kick. He's lengthened that from inside 50 to 55, 58 metres. Yeah, he kicks a good one, doesn't he? There's two. This is two from Saturday night. Look at the height Huge of Huge bombs they are, which reminded me of the one he kicked in the grand final last year. And probably to me last year was the most significant goal of the game. Well, this is even further yeah. out. Yeah, I mean, that is a huge kick with the Premiership on the line. Seen their outside runners 
beat the uh, Sydney Collective outside runners. Yeah. And, that would beat and he's concern. one of them, but he can finish his work mm. and he's a chance from 60 metres. They desperately need Jetta to have a uh, big final six weeks mm. or five weeks and uh, come into the finals. Well, he, he's a player that's starting to find a bit of form. I think they were worried about him in the first half of the season. He's starting mm. to get better, but he's one that has the tools that they desperately need. Harry Cunningham's another that's got really good leg speed. There's a few of them there. Is Jetta working hard enough? You'd like to see him get a bit more of the footy. And when you're that quick, if you're working hard enough, you probably should get more of the footy. He probably relies on some of the midfield getters, yeah. though, and uh, that's where they lost the game, the Sydney Swans. Their guns through the middle, despite the fact that they were gener generating some inside ball, they were uh, well and truly down. It's rare that you keep this crew, this the, the class of this group of players, to the numbers that they did. So they were able to keep them well below, apart from Jack, who was uh, pretty close. The others are well below what they would mm -hmm. normally produce as far as their season. Isn't it funny, go. we're talking about Kennedy being down and he's kicked 25 <laughs> and bombed that big last quarter yeah, goal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's down for him because yeah. he's normally 30. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and his dad's on uh, open mic straight <laughs> after <laughs> the program. Jason, we sent you a task. We don't often see John Longmire uh, overtly angry in the box. He usually covers it over the mouth. But this time, he had plenty to say to Torbo, the ruck coach, and we wanted to find out what he was actually talking about. Well, it was after a passage of play, wasn't it? And we think it wasn't... He is the ruck coach, but Sam Reid tends to play the second yep. ruckman when uh, Mike Pike is having a spell. I reckon he'd be disappointed with the Adam Goods tackle to start with. That was pretty ordinary. But then the long kick comes in, you can see Reid goes back. He's the loose mm. tall that's yep. back there mm. that doesn't get back hard enough. Teddy Richards probably lost contact with his man as well. And rough head in traffic comes out and takes the chest mark. He might have just... He needed to let steam off. I think he was <laughs> disappointed with the passage of play. Torbo, you're my man. I'll take it out on you. He's used to copying it, Torbo. He's everybody's... <laughs> Punching yeah. bag. Buddy and Tippett looked uh, fantastic, oh. with the exception of Buddy's conversion. For the second time against the Hawks this year, isn't it, that he's been wayward? That's 5-12 in two games. Yeah, against he them, was yeah. hot early, though, wasn't he? Like, I looked at him and thought, this is the best player in the competition in this form. And that was what the... about when they combine like this? Yeah. So a contested ball on the wing where he pushes Gibson away and then kicks it to Tippett, who takes a contested mark. Tippett's a brute, but when you've got a bloke with that size and strength that can move like that, He's going to be an incredible weapon. The two of them together, if they keep does, them healthy and on track, it's going to be big. Does Brian Lake uh, minimise the damage there? Because he's still yeah, he minuscule does. compared to Tippett. Now, he plays tall blokes well, doesn't he? Yeah, he Tippett does. He's got a history even doing more that. difficult yeah. than that. Well, what about the uh, the booing for Buddy, given what he's given to the Hawks? Mm. Is it all? It's no surprise, though. Is there, is there Gary ever Abbott a never got booed. No. Gary Abbott never got booed when he went back to Geelong. You went to the first game? Yeah, not you, one boo. You did a lap of the ground, didn't I hear did. one boo. Yeah, I had my hearing up, had the, the aids on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think Buddy would have expected a few boos. I mean, that's that seems to be normal these days. I yeah. want to show you a photo. Now, Colleen Pitch is a star. The two great photographers, Wayne <laughs> Ludby on the band, and Colleen Pitch, take, Pitch taking out one of the dollar bag behind Buddy. That is a great photo. <laughs> what, what was Wayne, what was Wayne Ludby uh, taking I don't know where he was headed with, <laughs> with his lens there, Jared. Are you worried about uh, Buddy changing your manager? You know Buddy better than anybody in this uh, house. You're That's not very about? well. That's not very well. Look, he's made a decision for what he thinks is best. I think for himself, off field, up in the Sydney market. That's. But what do you know? He asked you whether you worried about it for Buddy's benefit. Oh, I'm not worried about it. No, I, I haven't given it a hell of a lot of thought. Should like. the Swans be worried about it? He went up there to play footy. He wanted to get away from the limelight. Changed manager. Presumably to get more limelight. But surely, surely a player's entitled to make those decisions for himself. Yeah. So are you yeah, worried about the I'm not worried about does it. Does he need a football mind at his disposal that he can talk to You're about? You're asking the wrong person. Would you with him well, at the Sunday Footy Club for eight years? And he's like any player. You have. Is he like any player? Is he? I said, like any player, you have management issues with different players along the way. You often deal through their management. It's going to be a different person dealing You're worried, with. aren't you? I'm a little bit concerned. Yeah. I think it'd be great to uh, have stability. I mean, uh, Buddy is the key to the Swans' uh, surely, flag chances. You surely need to sit back and wait and see how it works out before you start saying you're worried. Be worried if things go wrong, but it might be the best movie he's ever made. You don't know. Possibly. I reckon you could do that uh, after you deliver your first premiership. Friday night, it was a controversial uh, night. Ty Vick, Tyrone Vickery uh, t found out today that he was heading straight to the tribunal. In many ways, Mike, it uh, reminded me of a throwback to a, a more violent era in the 70s and the 80s. 70s and 80s. And I'm not laughing at what we saw here, but this is what was... It wasn't normal, but it wasn't unusual, was it, in this period of time with the, ra the coat hangers and the raised arms and the elbows? There's Big Carl. We've seen Barmy and Big Carl. Oh. There's Barmy again, who's... Uh, oh. Put uh, Jeff Southby to sleep. But we've always 
just thought that's a thing of the past, haven't we? We did. We did. And, and no one has condoned this, have they? The only issue about this has been how Richmond responded initially after mm. the game and what the penalty will be. You're pretty critical of Damien Hardwick, uh, and I thought also Trent Cotchin got it wrong. I think everyone was at Richmond was trying to find a way to support their man yep. at the same time to put the incident into perspective. I think on both occasions, though, they misfired. Enough people look at that during the week, but uh, what I will say is... I love the way Ty's been going about his footy. He's been incredible for over us for probably the last three to four weeks. You know, his attack on the ball's been outstanding. So, look, we'll uh, we'll make that have a look at that during the week. So other people will take care of that. But you know, he's a good player for us. I think the thing with Ty is we love um, him playing on the edge. His best games this year have been when he's most physical. Uh, we love him playing on the edge. So. I mean, there's going to be times where um, there's frustration for him and, and the team, but um, as you're well aware, Robbo, uh, in a team environment, we're going to support uh, our teammates as much as we possibly can. I thought it was confusing yeah. uh, to try and uh, give an alibi about a f aggressive and physical I player agree. overreaching. I think they miscued in, in the interest of, of the, the, the solidarity. Yeah, I wouldn't be too critical. They're trying to support him. It's, mm. it's hard to say the right thing. What are the right words there? You say, look, we love him when he's playing an aggressive style of game but he obviously stepped way over the edge. That's all I need to say. Well, I could explain uh, the Fremantle loss last week. It was one of the most inexplicable losses for many, but I could understand it. Players coming after a long season, almost uh, at the bye, think they've got an easy win. But I couldn't explain the Gold Coast, Mike, on the weekend. No, no, I'm with you on that. I watched the first quarter. You were up there, Jason. I, 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 I love the way Brisbane right. played their footy. We, we, but, ran, but, we ran the stats until we got five minutes into the second quarter because that's when they got 100 yep. possessions in yep. front. But this represents a pathetic effort. And at no stage of the game was there one single suggestion that any of the Suns were going to sit there and do something to alter the total submission mm. that was taking place. Mm. That was what disappointed me the most. You've been in footy clubs a long time, Jason, and uh, you played at Werribee Mike for a long time. <laughs> Thank you, And not professional here. <laughs> what is going on with that, that group? How can you have a mental, uh, a collective mental approach to that game, given that you've been beaten going into the bye, yep. you've got finals on the line, and the story finals, the challenge is there, Ablett's not there. Something is amiss for that reaction to be delivered. Well, that's why I found it such an insipid effort, the fact that they did nothing to try and alter the course of what was going on. It, I mean, that first quarter was the third biggest discrepancy in terms of possessions yeah. in the history of the game since we've been keeping possessions. Mike, I wanted to ask you whether you've heard anything perhaps about the Suns not being totally comfortable with Gary Ablett's decision to have the operation and not try and push on and play. Where's this come from? Well, there's a whisper floating around. I wanted to know. I go to the source. I don't like to act on rumours, uh, but have you heard anything? Well, two things on Ablett. They're now not 7 are they? Or not 8 when in games when he hasn't played. I think it's fair to say that the club uh, expected that Gazza would try with the shoulder to see how it went. And they might have been a bit surprised when he elected to have the surgery. But that's not the issue in this case. Oh, you can't. You certainly can't use that as an excuse no, I mean, for their this, last two weeks' effort. And it would be a sure. copy. They, surely the players couldn't be thinking this. Mm. Well, let me, let me give you an example of a couple of efforts from the, the Suns on the weekend. We're talking about stoppages in your defensive 50. Watch the way they allow Brisbane to dictate where they're going to set up, where they open up the space. Now, this uh, we'll see a couple of them in, uh, in quick succession. This one, Leicester actually kicks it out in the fully hits the point post. But he gets the little tap over the back into that space they open up. Same spot. Have a look at the move of the Brisbane players, they'll spread it out to create that same passage of space and this time they get punished because it's Zorko that gets on the end of it and he kicks a goal running straight into that channel once again. They did this all day. They 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 took no initiative. They allowed Brisbane to dictate to them from so, the start. So you could have a hundred of those? Yep. Yep. Bluey's got to select a team to play St Kilda uh, for the weekend. Does he make a statement at selection? I think he's got to make a statement. I, I, and I would say Zach Smith for what he didn't do when Martin mm. kicked the goal. I mean, watch this. Green over the top to Martin. Look, now I can't believe it. It's Zach... hard to explain that one. I wonder if he got disoriented and didn't see what actually happened with the footy because he oh, always puts his head down and stops. Well, there were that many goals kicked. He was probably heading back to he, the centre. He, he'd stopped and the head went down. I don't know if he even saw the ball coming up. It's hard to explain and, and, that. Harley Bennell, who in my view is the second most talented player in that group, mm. his performance was disgraceful. Would you sack him for the weekend? I, I think well, he's got to make a statement. No good making five changes and tipping five blokes that no one's ever heard of. Mm. He's got to drop a big name and say two weeks in a row, you've a, you've cost us a spot in the finals, mm. and B, you've embarrassed us on the national stage. I wonder whether that playing group has the genuine belief 
that they're good enough to play finals and it's really want to play the, finals. The, whether they've got the genuine belief or not, they didn't come to play. That's right. Now, that's an that's, old that's expression. That's the point I'm making because 90% yeah. of this game's played above the Pierce shoulders. Pierce Hanley had 14 possessions in the first quarter. He's, sure. as most, he's as dangerous as any player in the comp with the ball. He had 14 possessions. Yes, we're going to do uh, Brisbane later on in the program. <laughs> but after this, Brenton Sanderson's going to join us. Cracking match at the MCG, which saw the Crows, after so many weeks outside the eight, finally enter at the end of round 18, part B. It was a rugged start after three consecutive losses, but the coach, Brenton Sanderson, who has stayed over, joins us on the couch. Uh, welcome, Brenton. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Timing's been superb. Yeah, I've been lucky actually. Uh, this is my third time on the couch and uh, after three wins, so very, very happy. <laughs> you had a rugged start to the year, 0-3. and three, You were defeated the Saints in round four and then you had a, a very unfortunate uh, loss to the Demons, which really set the season back. Yeah, we've... Um We've had some challenges, particularly early in the season, and to start this to, to start the year with with zero wins and three losses, it's been a long way back mm. from there. And uh, since that moment, since round four, uh, we're nine wins and five losses, and thankfully those uh, those four losses have only been by small margins. I think by less than two goals. So we feel like our form's okay. Uh, it's taken us a long time to get into the eight, and obviously now we've got to maintain that. I heard you mention that a few times. It's almost like you've gone out of your way to convince the players we're actually not playing that badly. To get the confidence up and get them going? Yeah, I mean, this is a very young football team and uh, that was the youngest side we've played this year um, last night against Collingwood. So um, I've got enormous belief in this group yeah. and sometimes I think they do forget how good that they can be. And um, we've got a fantastic band of young players um, who are still very much uh, raw in their football development. And uh, guys like, you know, Dangerfield, Sloan, Jacobs, uh, Walker, Brody Smith, um, these guys are still only, you know, 21 to 24 years of age and have got plenty of improvement left in them yet so uh, the future for me is is very bright and uh, we just have to be sometimes patient and tolerant uh, for some growing pains. But you've actually made it younger you have elected to omit Rutten from the MCG, uh, a big game, a big player and Riley as well has seemed to uh, be out of favour uh, Yeah I mean to be honest though those guys, their attitude has just been fantastic and uh, they're, they're really good teammates and their form hasn't been at a level which I think that they're happy with and obviously we've left them out of some games but um, it's a sign of a good culture and a good football team when those players go back and play in the next level down in our reserves, in our in our state league team and and uh, and really teach those young kids to come on. So we will still need those boys for the rest of this season and I'm sure they're going to get back into the side soon. But um, that was a big step for us last night. Coaches obviously are painfully aware of the fascination we've had with the emotional swings that occur in the box. You're 23 points up in the second quarter. You fall to six points down midway through the last quarter. When do the emotions take over knowing that you, you know you've got to stick to your structures and what the processes are but when you when does the anger sort of throw you out of kilter oh this is an incredibly emotional uh, job and um, I, I guess to be honest the the anxiety starts a long time before the, the bounce of the ball and um, for a for a young playing group, for any playing group, you can't let the players see uh, sometimes that raw emotion. And we do, I mean, all the coaches, we do let out some, some raw emotion at times. And um, you do make better decisions when you're calm. Um, and that's where you need good people around you, in the, particularly in the coaches' box, just to remind you to, to not lose your cool and to remain, you know, process driven. But you are human. And like John Longmore has acquired the habit of putting his hand to his mouth. And you sat alongside Bomber Thompson, who can actually be a bit emotional at times. How did he handle it? Yeah, well, I mean, Bomber was a fantastic mentor for me, and I sat next to him for four years as an assistant coach. And um, whenever the cameras went to Bomber in the coach's box, you always saw him very relaxed. And but he did he did lose his cool, but that was always done. You know, put his head under the desk and then scream <laughs> and rant and rave, and then he'd come back system. up and yeah. he'd just be nice and calm. So, um, so I, do you do that as well? 
I haven't been as good at it this year. The women, are, we've, we've had some challenges, and I do have to keep improving that uh, that element of the game. But we, we know, not just coaching, at any point you do make better, clearer decisions when you are calm. And uh, but as Mike said, in that last quarter when Colin hit the front, when Beams kicked that goal. Mm. Um, you can't help but just for a second think, uh, you know, we've got to hit the panic button here. But uh, thankfully, we've got some great young leaders on our on our team, and we're able to uh, to get to get back in front and stay there. Also, would have been a few things going through your head when Paddy Dangerfield went down late in the game, mm. and uh, there was a shot of you sort of a little nervous, your fingers were twitching. Yeah. Um, you had a chat to him after the game, but the news looks to be pretty good. Yeah. Thankfully, um, he doesn't require any scans, but. Um, uh, I, I was very nervous when I did hear him say that he heard a pop. Um, that's almost the heart, heart skips a beat when you do hear that, when a, when a player uh, talks about that. But it's very difficult to keep this, this player down. He, he does play banged up a lot. Yeah. It's impossible to keep him from playing, but um, it looks like the news is good. But he's 24 and he yeah. plays this high attrition football. I mean, early in the season we talked about this. How long can he play the battering ram style of footy? Yeah, well, he reminds me of Chris Judd at the same age where, you know, Judd was just all inside and contested. and. Um, we are trying to teach him. We're spending a lot of time with him during the week to try and get some some outside ball because he's because of his speed, uh, he could really hurt the opposition outside the contest. But he's very much a see ball get ball type of player. Um, but without doubt, the most courageous player I've ever seen play and obviously coached. Uh, um, he he has classic white line fever. He reminds <laughs> me of. Um, of uh, Gary Hocking, who's just, who was just so calm and quiet during the week, but then at two ten on a Saturday, um, he'll just, he'll just move heaven and earth to get the footy. Were you surprised at the matchups? Rory Sloan uh, got McCaffer, and Dangerfield was head to head against uh, Beams, and there was a lot of debate in the Herald Sun this morning about it. And yet I noticed in the uh, Herald Sun that they gave Beams best on the ground, and they were querying why Dangerfield wasn't tagged. Yeah, I mean, both of those guys are really important for us, and um, I, mean, I think most teams do Dangerfield, which is um, which is probably what I would do if I was coaching against Adelaide. But Sloan is a really important player for us as well. You know, he he is very much an inside-outside player for mm. us. He is our link between the arcs, and uh, thankfully, I'm coaching both of those boys, and it can give the opposition some headaches. Bloke that no one else has really mentioned, but you've mentioned him a few times this year is Brody Smith. He's had an outstanding year. Some of the things he's done have been brilliant. Has he surprised you, or did you always know he was going to be this good? No, I mean, he's still very young, and um, uh, he's leading the competition for metres gained. Yep. He's leading the competition for rebound 50s. Um, he's a real springboard for us out of defence, and uh, he's kicked, I think, uh, 11 or 12 goals now yeah. as a running halfback for us, and um, he's, a, he's a very important player for us. Um, I am reluctant to talk about him too much because I still think he gets under the guard of a lot of opposition, and um, it's helped him too, having Henderson back. You know, we, yep. we didn't get Henderson back until two weeks ago, and the with both of them uh, structurally for us, setting up across half back does allow us to punch the ball out of there with uh, with a fair bit of damage. I think the secret's out, Jason. <laughs> Look at the numbers <laughs> there. David King's been running the case for him for the All Australian. In fact, he's got his own personal All Australian, and he's uh, front and centre. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think probably Smith and Talia for us would be the locks in the All Australian uh, uh, defence for at end of the season. Can I go to the other end of the spectrum and ask you about James Podsy Adley? I know what Jason Dunstall thought when he had that shot for goal and he went on the angle. Yep. Now, what did the coach think? Uh, my preference from that part of the ground would be to kick a drop punt, and uh, you can see from the vision here. I mean, he's he's not directly in front, but he's not far off directly in but front. But he's a left footer. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. I mean, I think I think Steve Johnson is to blame for all this. You know, that's um, <laughs> it's 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 quickly become uh, uh, the norm for a lot of. But that's funny for you to laugh with him there. If you'd lost the game by a kick, would you have been laughing with him? Uh, I mean, I I see those guys nail them every day at training, and they do spend hours and hours uh, on their technique, and that's obviously what. What James feels comfortable doing. Do they spend um, enough time on their drop punts? <laughs> um, maybe they should sp spend more. I mean, I, I, ultimately, I think a player has to do what he feels comfortable yeah. in doing. But. Um, but that one for me should have been a drop punt. I mean, the reason I was laughing with Pods too, I mean, that, that's one of the great stories uh, in the modern game. I mm -hmm. mean, yep. the James Pods, the Adelie story of being overlooked for 10 drafts uh, to make his debut as a 28 year old and to win a premiership and play 100 uh, AFL games. He was really emotional after that game. I mean, that's a fantastic achievement and, um, and one that I'm, I'm really proud of, yeah. It's a great story. Uh, the Crows style at the present time, it's uh, very exciting, but
but it, at times it borders on overuse of the footy. Where do you get the balance right? Yeah, it's 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 the element of coaching, I guess. I, I, I do like to take the game on. We like to put speed on the game. I think what we've found the last couple of weeks in particular is we have overused the handball. There's been some opportunities when we've been out and we should have kicked and we've just handballed once too many. Yeah. And particularly with, I think we've got some targets ahead of the ball. Uh, we should be looking to, you know, attack the last line of the opposition's defence. And uh, I know it's frustrating for our fans because we uh, we have turned the ball over a lot this year uh, and it's come from just those one extra handballs. Yeah, we saw that uh, in the, even in the highlight in the opener. Uh, long kick into a contest. Uh, Pods taps it out to Sloan, Sloan goals. You, you don't seem to be backing in your tall forwards uh, enough to justify having four of them down there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, those guys have provided a fantastic target yep. for us all year. Um, Jenkins, Podsy, Adley, Walker, and even Lynch plays tall. So um, we shouldn't have any fear at taking the ball forward. When you sub right off, did you consider taking one of the tools off? Yeah, we did. Um, uh, it's it's always hard that sub yep. that sub one, and we do spend. I think we do waste a lot of energy talking about who we should sub off. Um, I would have preferred just to keep rolling, but you have got a fresh player there, and you have to use him. But it was a healthy debate in the coaches' box whether it was a tall or whether it was right. Coaches don't like the sub. You were at a uh, dinner at Gillam McLaughlin's house a couple of weeks ago. I guess the sub got a fair run. Yeah, it did amongst uh, a, a lot of subjects and. Uh, um, to Gil's credit and the AFL's credit, uh, Gil was really receptive to, to listening to the coaches and the clubs and, uh, you know, Mike Fitzpatrick and also Mark Evans were there as well and uh, it was a fantastic night actually. We sat around for sort of four or five hours with, um, I think there was 11 senior coaches mm. there and um, Gil was great and uh, to his credit he listened and... Um, and hopefully we can see some changes which I think we need to that need that need to be made. Are you suggesting a little more receptive than his predecessor to perhaps the coach's input? Uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, we talked about a lot of things about you know the holding the ball rule and the sub rule rotations, and um, I think we know. I mean, we, we, we do know we've got a great game, yeah. and we do need to make a couple of little adjustments just to make sure that it remains great. A couple of personal ones before you go. Nathan Buck is a very good friend of yours. Any dialogue pre-game, and have you spoken to him in a debriefing sense? Um, no. Not much pre-game. I mean, the schedules are so busy. But um, uh, we caught up uh, last night after the game, and um, I mean, Bucks is a quality person, as you know. And uh, the Collingwood coaching position is heavily scrutinised, as are most most coaching roles. But um, he'll be fine. They've got a they've got a great football club, or he's got a great football club behind him. Uh, they've got some challenges with some injuries as well, but um, they've got plenty of fight left in them, I'm sure. And the other one, Dean Bailey. You were close in terms of professional and personally. What sort of impact did that have on the? club? It's really hard to read to be honest because um, I mean Dean lost his battle with cancer only a week before the season started and it was just so fast you know he got diagnosed uh, only three months earlier and um, we didn't start the season well and it's sort of hard to gauge how it affected me how it affected the other assistant coaches and also to the playing group but um, we've had some challenges this year um, and thankfully our young groups uh, um, fought them all head on. Nathan Van Burlo is still out, your uh, captain. When Sloan and Paddy Dangerfield are both available to be captain, <laughs> will you toss the coin? Will you uh, just go with the co-captains? Because they are two mighty even players. Yeah, it's something I think we'll have to debate. I mean, this is uh, to, co uh, to captain the Adelaide Football Club is a is a really big job. I mean, we have a lot of commitments outside of just playing mm. that uh, the, the guys have to meet, and uh, the co-captains has worked for us this year. I think both of those boys um, have been fantastic. They're both only 24 years of age and. Um, Nathan Van Burlo is our captain, uh, but probably won't play uh, a huge on-field role this year. He's, he's probably, with, with five games to go, he's probably five games away from playing. So mm. um, we'll have a look at that at the end of the season and I guess make a decision about what we do going forward. Five games to go. You've got the Eagles uh, at the Adelaide Oval on the weekend. You've got a uh, challenging run home, but a, uh, a run home that suggests you should make the finals uh, if you produce your best. Good luck. Thanks for coming in after round eight. Part B. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Brenton Sanderson, our special guest on the couch. More to come straight after this. It's black mind taking the city. Stole the match, gets inside 50. That's as good as he's ever done in a match. 
Possibly went, but it's been a great turnaround story for the Brisbane Lions under first year coach Justin Lepich. And Goose Maguire, he was absolutely thrilled to knock through his 21st goal in his extended career. And I think it is an extended career. I don't think he was in Justin Lepich's uh, original plans. And he's worked his way back in and he's had a fine second half. Yeah, second half last year was good and he's gone on with it this year. They, they, them as a group, Jason. Yep. You saw them firsthand this time. We saw them against North Melbourne. There's a lot of promising signs with the Lions. Uh, they're better, better than I thought. At the beginning of the year, I was a little bit of the prophet of doom. I thought this is a squad that yep. doesn't have a lot of class in it and they might be a long way off it. But all of a sudden, if you added players like Lewenberger and Rich and Redden back yep. into that lineup, yep. but it's not looking that bad, is it? You mentioned Tom Rockliffe. Eventually, mm. you need some leadership and some blokes to stand up. He is number one in the stand-up category, along with Pierce Hanley. But uh, here's the numbers, and he's in pretty good company. That's there, great isn't company. It? He's not as flashy. Not I know he's, he's not as stylish as the others, but uh, you've got to. The, the numbers speak for themselves, don't they, they? They do. And he's actually on track to become the first Brisbane Lion ever to average 30 plus wow. possessions a season. Well, those ranking points, they are, as you can see, they're all Australian ranking yep. points numbers. Yep. If you're averaging 120, you're having an absolute belter of a season. He's, he's 24, closing on 100 games. Look, he, he's really important for them because he's a cocky kid, mm. has plenty to say. He's a good leader, isn't he? Yeah, and they've said, look, he's got to temper that enthusiasm, that aggression, that uh, that cheekiness, if you like, and if he channels it the right way, he's got a lot to offer them. For the second time in four weeks, we're talking about Pierce Hanley and yeah. not being tagged across the half-back line. He's a very penetrating player, and it's surprising that uh, he wasn't picked up by uh, Bluey 30, and the Gold Coast. How can you have 31 uncontested possessions in a it's game It's extraordinary. It, it, absolutely extraordinary. And he's gained 1,062 yeah. metres, second on the all-time list. He's just you know, when you look at him, you look at some of this use of the footy. We talk about players new to the game and how they pick up the skills. This guy kicks it as good as anyone. That's off one step. He's kicked it around the body, across the body, 45 metres. There's a reason for that, Jason. Have a look at the vision. This one, he'll kick a couple across his body. He chips them yeah. into the space where players are in. This is the kick I really love. Look at the weight of it. Yeah. Look, look at the pressure, where he, though. It has not broken stride. Well, that's that's an issue, too, in itself. This one here, he finishes off. He was involved three times in the build-up to that. He's that a natural passion. athlete who's been taught from a blank canvas. Yeah. So he doesn't have any bad habits as a four, five, six-year-old. He starts from... Same as Ty Canelli. And I, I was a huge Canelli fan. I think Hanley's as good as Canelli. Can be better. Steph Martin's one of the stories, uh, and he's had a lot of press. He's done this before in about a 10-game period for Melbourne where there was injuries and he was thrown into the ruck. They tried to make him into a key position player. He is flying at the present time. The question is, when Lewenberger yep. comes back, what does Justin Lepage do to not kill this bloke's career? You think he's a natural ruckman, don't you? He is absolutely yep. a ruckman. I've yep. seen him play at centre-half forward and full forward. He can pinch hit there, but he can't dominate there. Can Lewenberger play permanent forward as the relief ruckman? I don't know. Can the, maybe it's a 60-40 a or a 50-50 split in the ruck and forward, perhaps, to try and get the best out of Stephen Martin, but you certainly don't want to compromise what Lewenberger Can he play ruck rover, do you think? Then you're talking about it at the expense of a Hanley or a Rockley for mm. these sort of players. I don't think you can do that. Let's move on to the Tigers uh, from a positive sense. Fourth win in a row. They've turned it around. The question's going to be if they finish just outside the eight, Mike, and their mathematical chance of finishing just inside the eight, but mathematical only. Will it be fool's gold or not? No, I think not. I think that they were complacent early in the season, back off the back of last year's 15 and a half wins. But their last four have been good. I think they've now got their heads in the right spot. Is it plausible that they could uh, make the eight? The, well, it's three it's, more it's wins. mathematically possible. I can't see it. No, is it I, there's a difference. Possible and plausible. I, they win three of the last five, and the, in the form that they're, they're growing into, they could win five. Yeah, but well, it's a big ask. And then, So you don't see them as credible in, in terms of a finalist? Playing the eight this year, no. The issue of Fool's Gold, I think, was addressed uh, by Ivan Marek. You yeah. spoke to him on 3 AW, and I think what he says uh, suggests that there may be some positives uh, to come out of this down season. Initially, I get really upset with the way the year's gone, but I feel like it's been so good for us to go through that because our training standards and standards around the footy club were, were so poor and the attention to detail with all the, the little things were 
were not up to the standard we set in a season before. It's a barefaced admission. It was really yep. honest. But if they do learn from it and they up their ante as far as their preparation, well, maybe they can get something out of it. I think the playing group shares that view, which mm. they need to, don't they? It shouldn't be just one man's opinion. No, I think they all have to buy in, but there's, there's yeah. some talent there. What about Anthony Miles? This kid that was uh, on the uh, GWS list finds himself at Richmond. He's one of those kids that can just find the footy. It seems to follow him around. I think one of these, what you, when you see sides uh, rise and become powers, they all have one thing in common. They find a rookie or yep. two to jump out of their skins and become A-grade players. And this kid's on the way. And you'll notice in these highlights, all the work he's doing, Mike, is in tight, is mm -hmm. inside. Yep. We've got some numbers here that suggest, have a look at these centre clearances we're talking about. When he's in there, look at the win percentage ratio. Yep. And when he's not in there. Look at the losing percentage ratio and the differences that he makes when he's in and not in. Is that a bit of an indictment on the blokes that were there before? Well, perhaps, but it shows the quality that Anthony Miles yeah. has brought um, inside to the uh, to the Tigers. And that enthusiasm and the energy around the footy is contagious, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, he's, oh, I think he's been one of the finds of the season, no doubt. We'll move on to uh, one of the major issues of last week uh, to get your thoughts, Mike. James Hurd was welcomed back and then he was told in no <laughs> uncertain terms that he wasn't as welcome. And he was the subject of a discussion on SEN this morning in which Terry Wallace uh, made his thoughts well known. He's going to have to go back into that football club next year without having any real knowledge of what how they've performed how all the departments have performed this year this year yep. why wouldn't have they put him back in there for a month and allowed him just a, as a background person to be analyzing how the strength and conditioning's working to analyze how the the doctors are working to analyze how the the box is working it doesn't make any sense if he's going to be the coach next year why he wouldn't be in an analytical position well, he's able to do the analysis, but he's not allowed to do it at the footy club. Mike, give us some yeah. sense in this. Well, What's I, happened? Well, I understand where Plough's coming from. If his suspension's completed, let me put in yep. brackets here, the suspension should have been for the season and not till August 25. But given it'll be completed, he should be free to do what he wants, shouldn't he? I understand that, but the club has obviously elected him well, no, well, not to do that. Uh, so only, what's changed? Only in the last few days. Now, what's the club changed? Been. Well, I think... Uh, I'm, uh, this is... Not, this is what I'm hearing. Now, I don't know this to be factually correct, but what I'm hearing is that Neil Craig doesn't think he should come back and he's the head of football. Yep. Bomber's not mad keen on him coming back for the rest of this season. There's divisions at board level about what his role should be and how they should handle him. So I think they took the conservative view and said, we can solve all this and just not have him around the place. It seems to be a, b a bit of a turnaround, doesn't it? I mean, there was a, a, a really interesting article written by Mark Robinson, Fox Footy's uh, and AFL 360's own Mark Robinson, that suggests that the mindset is changing a little bit and instead of what we thought, they were just desperate to get him back and whack him straight in there, things are going to turn around. And in actual fact, he copped a lot of criticism over the article, Robert, <laughs> from perhaps the most preeminent journalists in the footy community. That doesn't happen very often, does it? Why no, is that? Not publicly, it doesn't happen. There's a bit of a uh, privately, but publicly, there's Patrick Smith. And this is to varying degrees. Patrick Smith, Damien Barrett and Carolyn Wilson have all been critical of Robbo. But Robbo was seen to be, at one point, there's a polarised view on this, he's at one end of the spectrum and the other three and most other people in the media are at the other end. And, and, and I think there's been some history here. Robbo has smacked Caroline and Patrick Smith earlier in the year. I think Patrick certainly Payback. took the opportunity to whack him back. <laughs> Damien and Robbo don't get on. So uh, Damien said that when Robbo writes his column, he does it in an S and Java with number five on the back. Robbo said to me that they didn't care. He doesn't take any notice that he's doing it as he sees it. But what it does reflect to me is that this, there's divisions everywhere here. Mm. And the media one's immaterial. It's what happened at Essendon and the coaching staff. And it's not a healthy situation. I picked up a division between you two earlier in the program. I hope it doesn't come out in Mike's <laughs> mad minute. Stay tuned. In 1983, mm. Colin Robertson wins the Norm Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, you and he both played ex extremely well in, in the same area of the ground. Mm -hmm. You both wear numbers in the 30s. You both similar colouring and build. You both had moustaches. Yeah. Were you robbed of the Norm Smith? <laughs> <laughs> now tell no, me no, the no, answer no. you gave me before we came on. <laughs> no, no, no. If you go back and have a look, Robbo did play a pretty good game. What was your favourite prank? 
pulling the chain off your bike. <laughs> I see you spin around, spin your legs around, yeah, those little legs. Serena yeah, pub. Serena pub. Yeah. Who did this? <laughs> oh, I, I knew who did it. Yeah. <laughs> when I looked over the window and saw 30 blokes led by you laughing, I knew who did it. Son of Don't Think Do, John Kennedy Jr., a great teammate of yours, Jason. He's a sensational bloke and he's also one of the best ever. I mean, we used to call him the world champ down at Hawthorne because if it came to bagging someone <laughs> or to pulling pranks on teammates or to causing strife by having a word to one blubber saying, oh, mate, he was saying this the other day, <laughs> he is seriously one of the best at doing those sorts and of things. And he's a feature of Open Mike and it's coming up straight after On The Couch. Uh, Mike's Mad Minute is upon us and he's weighing into your territory, Jason. It doesn't surprise me. He's been all over me tonight, but uh, <laughs> Mike did say last week after Port Adelaide got out of jail against Melbourne and Jay Schultz kicked that terrific set shot um, in the last, uh, in the dying minutes, yep. you said it should be goal of the week. Yes, I did. The three nominations have come out from AFL House. It's not amongst them. You're kidding. So this one from Cochin. Oh, the fluke from Cochin is, is there. in? Oh, well, okay. That's a great, great goal. H how would he be if you asked him to repeat it with another 15 goes? Well, I didn't realise that's the qualifications for it. This one from uh, Stringer. Yeah, not yep. a bad goal. Yep. And this one, have a look how many times he gets involved. So he picks it up. Defensive side of the wing. Hits Zorko with a beautiful pass. Now, you've got to remember where P.S. Hanley was. He's still running. Still running. Still running. There he is. He's just come back into screen. Still running. Continues on. Still running. Gets on the end of yeah, it. Yeah, it's a great goal. That's a great goal. The subtle difference here, Jason, is you should remember, <laughs> Jay Schultz kicked the goal here against Melbourne that won the game and saved their season against the clock and had to be kicked to win the game. How many could have kicked it? What a, uh, well, to quote Paul Roos, the coach of the Melbourne Football Club, I don't reckon anyone else would have kicked it. And Ruzzi on the back of that has picked himself up an extension <laughs> to his contract. Everyone's favourite player, Lenny Hayes, is our special guest next week. We'll see you then. Thank you, Jason and Mike, and thank you. <laughs>